you know, when considering the rapture, considering the rapture, how many of you know that there's a rapture? Amen. You know, there's teaching going on. There's no rapture. A lot of heresy out there, y'all. Right. But the rapture is going to happen. The trumpet's going to sound. It, it's our blessed hope. It's our blessed hope. But I have mixed feelings about the rapture. What are you saying, Pastor? Here's what I'm saying. How many of you are looking for that day to happen? We're snatched up out of here, right? But the flip side of that, Lord, can you hold off so somebody else might hear your word? You know, um, I remember this old uh, Jewish proverb um, a, a good friend of ours, Abraham Sandler, is a Messianic Jew, and he told, tells a story that, you know, you're familiar with the story of the Red Sea. Moses led the Israelites, right, out of Egypt and led them through the Red Sea. He said when they got to the other side, the Israelites were dancing, and Miriam and all the women were shaking and dancing and celebrating. While the Israelites were dancing, God was weeping that he had to destroy the Egyptians in the Red Sea. You see, that's the heart of our God. That's the heart of our God. You know, that, um, you know, he, he doesn't want to see, as we read the scripture earlier, wish none would perish. None. So it's up to us to get the word of God out there. Amen. In full force. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, listen, our next speaker, um, we met in a very, I guess, would be a precarious <laughs> way. But how many of you know God knows how to connect dots? Amen? So I'm in India. Um, I don't know, this is several years ago now. I was in India, and while I'm there, a pastor from Pakistan contacted me and um, wanted to know if we would be interested in, in going on their television program called the River of Life Channel. Well, how many of you know when you get messages from anywhere in the world, I mean, it's like you got to do some research, you know, where's this coming from, right? Right? No, I mean, it just makes good sense. So uh, we chit-chatted back and forth, and so he goes, well, I know a brother in, in, in the United States, and he's been here before. I said, oh, okay, well, give me his name and number, and, you know, let me vet you a little bit. Yeah, come right out and say that, but, you know. So let me find out what the, what the time of day is. So he gives me, and I look at it, and it's like a West Virginia number. And I'm like, wow, this brother's pretty close, actually. <laughs> you know, because you don't know where he's at, and it kind of could have been California. <laughs> so anyhow, I, I had called Rob, and I asked him, you know, about um, Naeem and, you know, what they were doing there. And he goes, yeah, man. He goes, I was there, and they do have a television program. And um, we weren't even doing video at all at that time, you know. But the Lord began to speak to my heart about doing video and, um, and getting on the program. And so we launched our Go Beyond Television ministry, and we are broadcasting over there still today um, to some 2.7 million people or something that I think their they're television. We're always saying, yeah, you go to different places, and it's, you know, it's on TV over there. So um, and then it launched, and then, you know, we're on Cornerstone here and so forth. But, um, you know, it's just one other way of evangelism. You know, it's getting the gospel out all over the globe. But that's, so through a pastor in Pakistan, I meet my brother Rob <laughs> in, in West Virginia. So, so when I call him, I'm talking to him. Now, I'm from Pennsylvania, so I know how West Virginians sound. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody? I mean, they got their own little twang, if you know what I'm talking about, right? But I'm talking brother don't sound like he's from what because he's saying a boat an oat <laughs> now see I, i'm familiar with that 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 little canadian because i watch hockey right so this brother don't sound west virginian to me you know what i mean so where are you from oh i'm from toronto canada you know so uh you know i meet a guy through pakistan from toronto's living in hurricane west virginia amen so rob he's the founder of epicenter ministries international and is a member of a new breed of believers that is hungry for a fresh manifestation of God's glory in the earth. Is there anybody like that in here this, this afternoon? Amen. Rob's an effective communicator of the heart of God and is being used mightily in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. His passion is to see the God of the Bible reveal himself to this generation. Rob was born and raised in northern Ontario, Canada, but now resides in West Virginia and, uh, with his wife and daughter. 
Rob has ministered in Africa, Asia, North America, and continues to go wherever the Lord sends him. Rob also serves in the marketplace where he works in the financial industry and has seen Jesus perform the same miracles that have taken place in international crusades and on the mission field. He is a firm believer that signs and wonders are not relegated to the mission field, mm. but are a part of lifestyle that is to serve and demonstrate the love of God to all mankind. Now, Rob just recently came back from Cuba and uh, later this year, he's slated to go to India and, and Germany. So he certainly is a globetrotter carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. So without any further ado, would you please put your hands together, give a nice Judah Ministries warm welcome for my brother and co-labor. Now, I wonder if I can get a copy of that, and then I'm going to see if I can convince my wife to read that to me every time I come home and just say, hit me with it. That's, you know, man, it makes you feel good. Man, it's so awesome to be here. You know, it was like during worship, there's, you know, there's nothing better than the presence of God. You know, because you can do a whole bunch of stuff, but the truth of the matter is, without the presence of God, it's not going to matter anyway. You know, we all want power, we want signs and wonders, but the truth of the matter is, if you don't carry the presence of God, it ain't going to happen. And we become no different than any other religion in the world. And we end up just talking a big game with no demonstration to back it up. You know, which is really the definition of a hypocrite. We like to talk about the people that are going to church on Sunday and clubbing on Saturday night, but the truth is, the real hypocrisy I believe the Lord was talking about was declaring his kingdom and then not actually manifesting it. So, what's the secret? You know, we can give all kinds of strategies and the Lord does, but the truth of the matter is, we're supposed to minister to people the way Jesus ministered to people. Right? We don't need to complicate stuff. What did Jesus do? If somebody was demonized or possessed or oppressed, he set them free. If they were blind or deaf, he set them free. He healed them. Right? He did large mass crusades where they had to multiply the food to feed them because there were 5,000 men plus women and children. Uh -huh. He also did one-on-one -on -one with the woman at the well. Got a word of knowledge that she had a whole bunch of husbands. Ended up saving a whole town. You know, just simple little things. He wasn't walking around perched up like he's royalty. Everybody who was royalty hated him. Right? And the crew he had with him was a bunch of fishermen. And I read one commentary, it said it would be the same thing as taking hillbillies from the hills of West Virginia and sitting in front of the deans of MIT. That's what the equivalent would be, which is why they were so offended when they were able to speak the work of God to those gentlemen. They said, listen, we don't know where they've learned all of this stuff. And they were in awe and amazement. They said, but we know one thing, they've been with Jesus. Right? If you want to be an evangelist, in whatever capacity. The number one secret is you have to spend time with Jesus. Because if you're going to love people the way Jesus loved them, if you're going to see them the way Jesus sees them, the only way you can get his heart is by spending time with them. Right? Think about it. You hang out with your friends, you start laughing like you friends. You start using the same words that your friends use. You know, your kids come home, I know when my daughter comes, I know who she's been hanging out with, because she starts talking like that one friend that I don't like, right? So who do people say that you're hanging out with? Right? It's, it, evangelism isn't giving somebody a track, right? And there's nothing wrong with tracks. God uses them. I know, and listen, the Lord tells you to do it, do it. I know people who've been saved by tracks. But what the Lord wants is he wants you to be the track. Like there's a difference. We're a living epistle, right? We want to say, I'm an ambassador of the kingdom. What does that mean? You are coming in representation of Jesus himself. 
That's why he says, when you drive things out, drive them out in my name. Because an ambassador carries the full authority of the king of that kingdom that you represent. So if I come into a place, I am there standing in the place of Jesus to the people I'm in front of in order with the same power and authority to do the things that Jesus gave us the authority to do. So if there are sick there, we pray for the sick for them to be healed, right? Because the word says, these signs will follow those that believe. If you lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. It's not me or you that's healing them. It's the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus that's doing it. But he wants us to be his representation in the earth. Right? Listen, he wants to give you guys such an impartation today. Like, no, like this isn't just... What you guys don't realize is, is that you've all been drawn to come here because you like evangelism and you've all got different, some of it's global, some of it's international, some of it's just one-on-one, -on -one, some of it's just a servant. But the Lord drew you here because there are gifts that he placed inside every single one of you that nobody else in this world has that he needs to awaken and unlock for you to be fruitful and walk out everything, right? What does Ephesians 4 say? Ephesians 4 says that he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, right? Why? You know, as gifts to the church. To equip the church, to equip the saints, to do what? To do the works of the ministry. The whole point of church is for you to get equipped so that the saints do the work. Think about that. We got it backwards. We got it, well, I need you to talk to pastors so you can get saved. No, you're supposed to be saving them. I need to talk to pastor because, you know, you've got an issue with drugs and we need some deliverance. No, you set them free. Because my Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that dwells inside of me and gives life to my mortal body. Think about it. The creator of the universe dwells inside of you. I love how we put it. Can the enemy with no teeth compete? The problem is, we don't think. That's right. Repent. Change the way you think, right? Was the, word, the word says, this is the thing. We need to stop making doctrine on our past experiences and make our doctrine based on what the word says. Right? Because if it doesn't line up with the word, it's hearsay. It is what it is. We wonder why we don't have results, but we're trying to explain things away on why we don't have stuff instead of grabbing the word, which is alive and the most powerful thing, and actually apply it and say, you know what? I'm going to actually believe what it says, and I'm going to take a stand, and just like the three boys in the fire, come what may. Even if I get burned up, I want everyone to know that we're believing that God is the one true God. It works the same thing. We have to rely on faith in order for salvation. Then why do we stop there? We don't want to do it for healing. We don't want to do it for finances. We don't want to do it for community events. We don't, we, but, but we have to do it for salvation. It's only by faith. So what do you do? Punch your ticket, and all of a sudden, the rest of life, you just kind of wait for it to happen. Or is God saying, listen, I need you to step up by faith because let's face it, if it's going to be supernatural, God has to have something to do with it. And the only time God has something to do with it is if you put yourself in a position where he has to show up. That's all faith is. You're not acting silly and taking stupid pills and jump off a bridge and expect the Lord to have angels come down and save you. But what he's saying is, hey, if my word says to go and preach the gospel and that the sick will be healed, then you can put yourself out there and say, listen, Jesus heals. Because this is the what I learned a long time ago. The biggest thing that most people are scared of is if what if God doesn't show up? If we can be real, right? Everybody's scared of it. It's like you feel that feeling. You got to go pray for somebody. And you're like, oh, man, I don't know. What if, what if they like... You don't think I'm an idiot. Well, the last time I checked, a dead man doesn't have an ego. You know, we got baptized. That guy was supposed to die. That woman was supposed to die and be, but we kept res resurrecting them. We want a pat on the back, right? We don't want our feelings hurt. We want, you know. Look at me, I'm the mighty man of God, you know, right? It's all about ego, you know? 
is getting resurrected, you know, and then you know what the Lord does? He shuts off the spigot. You got to eat a little humble pie. I've been there. Listen, it doesn't taste good, but you know what? I'm thankful for it. You know, I'll, I'll never forget, because this is what happens. The enemy wants to keep you from stepping out through fear because he knows that once you realize that you can be used by God, your life will change forever. Think about it. What if you actually thought that Jesus himself was standing beside you when you were ministering to somebody? Would you be scared to pray for them? No, he's right there. But there's one better. He actually dwells inside you. We need to change our mindset. He's not, he's in heaven, but his spirit dwells inside of us. We're still thinking that we have to wait for his spirit to come down and not realizing wherever we go, he's there. And you guys don't understand the power you have. Let me explain a perfect example. You go to the grocery store and you're getting ready to check out. And you can tell that the cashier, she's been through some stuff. She's probably a little bit jacked up. He's, and all of a sudden, she just starts unloading on you. She's telling you about her boyfriend. She's telling you about her kids. She's telling you about her drug. She's telling you about you've done with money. She's telling you stuff she shouldn't be telling you. And, you. and you start going, like, I don't care. I'm trying to get home, right? Hey, I'm just being honest. I'm like, man, the basketball game starts in a few minutes. I just came to get a snack to watch it, you know? And she's unloading. You're going, man, this is just awkward because, like, it, this is, like, stuff between good friends you might talk about. Well, what's actually happening? This is what's actually happening, right? The kingdom of God is where? It's inside you, right? Okay. Now, Jesus said, no, go and preach that the kingdom is here, right? He said, go and preach saying, hey, repent for the kingdom of God is here. Repent. Change the way you think. It's the word matineo in the Greek. It's change the way you think. So Jesus is saying, repent. Change the way you think. The kingdom is here. The kingdom means the reign and rule of God right? Then he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, right? That whole thing, freely you've received, freely give, okay? Are you with me? All right, so repent, change the way you think. The kingdom is here, the reign and rule of God is here, okay? So what's happening is this. Remember they said, hey, Jesus, when when does the kingdom come? They're going to say it's over here, it's over there. He said, no, because the kingdom of God is within you, right? So wherever you go, you carry with you the reign and rule of God, which is the full manifestation of the kingdom of heaven, which is why he prayed, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's the manifestation. He's asking us to pray his will because we carry that within us. You're at the grocery store across from that girl. This is what's happening. You, she steps into your presence and all of a sudden everything demonic leaves, everything else. Why? Because she didn't even realize it and you don't realize it, but her spirit recognizes that she's standing in the presence of Jesus. So because she's in complete peace, Because she's in complete safety with a perfect love, this is why she feels safe to pour it out to you. And how many times are we rejecting them and we're judging them, not realizing the whole time the Lord is wanting to use you to minister to her? See, evangelism, ministry, and loving people is a part of your DNA. Because we've got the king's blood that runs through us. It's his DNA that created us. We became a new creature in Christ Jesus. So there's not a mystical, you know, pixie dust. We're going to sprinkle with a wand. for all. You just simply have to know Jesus. Love people. And step out when the Lord tells you to step out. And he'll do the rest. And let me tell you something. I probably prayed for... Oh, over a hundred people before I saw one person get healed. Right? So I had a choice to make. I could either say, well, if it's the Lord's will, you'll get healed. Or I could say, you know what? I've been embarrassed enough. It's been like a hundred times. I'm done. I'm done. But you know what? The Lord just kept bringing back these scriptures to me. And he, and he kept saying, you know, do you really believe my word? Or are you going to compromise it? Because in these last days, the Lord is looking for a people, you know, for a group of people who are willing to stand up without compromise on the gospel and to demonstrate Jesus the way he intended it to be demonstrated. That's why I talk to There's going to be a great falling away because as the days go on, as things with politics and everything else goes on, it's going to cost you something in the West like it costs other people to be a Christian. 
already people don't want to say anything at work, and we are supposedly live in the greatest country in the world. What if so-and-so thinks I'm a Christian? They're going to say something to HR. I'm going to lose my job, you know, right? And we start thinking that we're in this total freedom. It's already starting to get into the mindset of us, right? Because we start having to weigh then, is it really worth the cost, right? When we get a Muslim, when we get a Muslim saved at our crusades, one of the things we have to tell them is, okay, count the cost because you're going to lose your family, your money, your job, and you're going to ha- never get to see them again. Because once you become a Christian out of a Muslim family in most of these countries, like in South Sudan and Pakistan, they put a hit out on you. You're done. So there's a cost to that. You know, we're worried about people complaining because and saying something negative because we've got a cross around our neck. You know, we got people that there's a cost. You know, and the thing is, we're in a part of the world where we have the opportunity, the wealth, the finances, the education to be able to impact the entire world. Amen? Man, God is good. Listen, he's going to heal some people in here today. I'm telling you that he's going to heal some people in here today. You know, and we don't have to wait until we pray. Right? Right? Listen, I can't tell you. I remember I used to think, like, the man of God had to pray for somebody to be healed because that was the only place of contact and da 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 right? I can't tell you. There's been times at our crusades where we'll get to the crusade, and during worship, people are getting saved, baptized in the Spirit, no preaching yet, healed, you know, crazy stuff. You know, it's, let me tell you something. If you want to be able to check out, you know, how smart you really think you are, Take a trip in the, on, on the mission field. Your theology is going to get blown up pretty quick, right? I think Pastor Michael understands that one on that. You realize that, geez, we complicate so much stuff. We do. We complicate so much stuff. What did Jesus teach? We're trying to find some new vein of revelation on everything that we can when the bottom line is we just need to love people, serve people, and tell them the truth. Because the truth of them, and we all know this, if I know you love me, you can tell me. I'll listen to you. But if I don't know you love me, I don't know if you're manipulating me. I don't know what you're trying to get out of me. I'm like, hey, that ain't going to happen. But I know when my father-in-law calls me up and he says, hey, we need to talk. I know he loves me. I know, so I'm going to listen to what he says because I know he has his best interests for me. Right? But too many times we got people that are trying to tell one another what to do and they're just trying to manipulate situations and you know I don't know who that's for but you know God bless you you know it's funny the Lord the Lord gives me prophetic words through jokes a lot of the time just you know uh, because everybody who's laughing wants to laugh because one it's funny or they just got busted (laughs) so everybody joins in right it's kind of like the old, we needed to have a prayer group, and all it turns into is a big gossip session, you know, right? And then we wonder why the new Christians end up turning into being crazy, manipulative, you know, Christians, because all they do, they get saved. They see all the old saints who are teaching them and gossiping about each other, you know? That's not in the notes. That's just the Holy Spirit talking. You know, Acts 1-8, right? We talked about it. Let me give you some numbers first, just so you guys get a context, right? So I asked Siri this morning, I said, Siri, what's the world population? (laughs) And she said, 7.6 billion people, which surprised me because the last time I did these numbers in my notes, it was like 6.7 ish. So I kind of surprised me. We were talking a little bit about that last night about India. But uh, so you've got 7.6 billion people in the world, roughly, you know. All right, and you've got uh, approximately three billion people have not heard the gospel in today's day and age. Forty, which works out to roughly thirty-nine point, you know, whatever percent of the world's population have not heard the gospel. It blows your mind, doesn't it? Well, think about where we come from, though. There's church on every corner. Most of us have family members who've been saved or grandmas or great-grandpa, you know. 
The church has helped out a lot of people in the community, you know, over the years, right? So the, stat, the statistic is 150,000 people die a day. Every day, like today, all around the world, about 150,000 people die. 60,000 of those people die without hearing the gospel. Think about that. It's a scary thought. That's what drives evangelists, right? It's a scary thought because you've got the eternal destinies of people standing in the ropes. So when you think about, you know, I don't want to talk to that person because I might get embarrassed. Well, how embarrassing just kind of doesn't cut it when you think about spending eternity in hell. You know, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, you know, it's an eternal, it's an eternal change. Those are just sobering numbers, right? You know, and people go, why do you go? Well, one, I was called to go, so I really didn't have a choice in it. You know, I had a choice, but I really didn't. You know, I just, you know, I, could, I couldn't have done any other type of ministry. Like, so in, I came to the U.S., played professional hockey, met my wife, went through Bible school, became a pastor, which I definitely was not called to do. But there was a lot of stuff. I was just killing people. It was bad. It was bad. It was bad. Thank God my father-in-law was there with me. But, oh, I still apologize and repent for some of the bad decisions and things I've, oh, Jesus. But I learned a lot. I needed to learn it, though, right? That's how you grow up, right? I had an awesome spiritual father who had no problem correcting me with the rod and letting me know and getting in my face and, you know, keeping me uh, where I should be. So I kind of had a desire. I knew I wasn't a pastor, never wanted a church, but I couldn't figure out where I fit, right? I'm like, eh, if I have to be a pastor, I'll be a pastor because I know that I'm called, but, I, you know, I just didn't want, I'd be so miserable, you know? And I love people, don't get me wrong. I just couldn't, you know, I just, it's not, I didn't care about the church. Like, I didn't want to, you know, and I, I had friends that are pastors, and the Lord's given these great visions for the church and for this. I didn't have anything, you know? And I'm like thinking there's something wrong with me. Am I in sin? Like, did I not get called? Like, you know, it's, you know, one of those things. So what happened was, um, I kind of was starting to figure out that, I was kind of an evangelist because, you know, I could go places and stuff would happen. People would start to get healed, you know, just stuff. And it, it wasn't like it was work. It just happened, you know. So I felt like going to the nations and I'd met a guy who was going to the nations. Um, and he ended up mentoring me and I was praying one morning. Ten years go by. I got prophetic words. You're going to the nations. You're, you know. And I'm like thinking, oh, it's going to be, you know, big thing. Ten years. I'm in Hurricane, West Virginia. I've got, we've got a church of like less than 25 people. You know, I don't know anybody. I'm working a job. And I'm like, I don't even know, you know, how this is going to play out. So I'm praying one morning and the Holy Spirit says, call Kevin and ask to go with him so that you can learn how to do it. So I call him up and I'm all pumped and I'm like, Kevin, I'll do anything. I'll carry your Bible. I'll wax your shoes. I'll, I don't care. I just want to go. I was praying the Lord said this. And I was all pumped. He's like, yeah, okay, I'll pray about it and get back to you. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm going, man, this isn't good. Lord, am I going to go or not go? And this is all he does, right? So, so we go through this whole thing and, uh, and then he calls me back three days later and he says, hey, I bought your plane ticket for you. Um, you know, you were going to go to India uh, in that April. This was in 2008. So I'm pumped, right? Because, you know, he does these big crusades um, and everything like that. So we go, and the first night, we go to the grounds. There's like 12,000 people standing and sitting there. Just a feel to see. I don't know if, if he showed some of those pictures. Um, there's, there's some there when they're receiving the Lord, but there's another one after that, another one after that. I think it's the last one. We might have it uh, there. So this is one of our crusades that we've done, you know, when we do them in India. Um, so we end up hitting uh, approximately 50 to 80,000 people. We hit a 30-mile radius, and we rent these big, huge, like, trucks, and we pack them in 
from all the rural villages and bring them to the crusade and then drive them home, you know, and then we've got the pastors that end up going in to follow up with them after um, to do the follow up and to plant the churches and to visit them and stuff. So, so we're going in October and um, so just pray for that. But listen, we do big ones. I've done small ones. Let me tell you something. Big ones cost money. All right. So big one like this in India, 20 grand. Okay. Just to give you guys an idea. All right. So I go to my first crusade. Small ones in Cuba, less than five grand. You know, it all depends on where you go, right? Because there's different costs. The biggest thing with India is renting the trucks. The more trucks you get, the more people you can bring. And my calling, I feel really called to the places who haven't heard it before. So they're really rural. They have nothing. So, you know, my thing is we're going to blanket an area and we're going to try to maximize and tap that as much as we can, right? So I tell you the price to tell you this. I go on the first crusade. We're with them. And he... Uh, he, uh, he's preaching the first night, all these people, I'm sitting there, and he does the invitation, they all get saved, and then this woman about 20 euros deep starts going, ah, she's like totally manifesting. I'm going, sweet, I get to watch how it's done, right? Hey, I had one experience with a demon, and I was 0-1. That person left probably worse than when they met me, and that demon walked all the way around me. I ended up just standing around that person speaking in tongues, demons laughing at me and I met the evangelist after I said listen this was like two years before I said I go I go man I go what happened how come he goes well did you ask the person if they wanted to get rid of it I said well no he said well did you command it to leave I said well no he's like well what did you do (laughs) I was like well I just sat there and prayed in tongues he was like "Well, well good for you but you know it's unless you you know right it says to cast out demons right Set people free. You know, you got the authority. You got to use it. But by sitting there going, who know that baba shindo ya baba shindo, you know, wetting my pants because I you know it's the first time I've seen a, somebody manifesting their eyes flip back. You know, so this happens, and I go, nice. I get to see how it's done, right? I get my notepad out, my video camera in the other hand, right? Hey, I want to learn from somebody who does it. I don't want to learn from somebody who's teaching and has no experience. You want to get yourself in a world of hurt? You know? Go find a poor person for them to teach you about finances. And tell me how that works out for you. They, made it, they got lots of advice. You need to do this. You need to do this. Well, let me tell you something. I probably read 200 books on deliverance. But it doesn't matter if you know the seven steps to this or the three keys to that. When you're face to face, it's not about the steps or the things. It's do you know how to do it and do you understand the authority that you carry. Amen? So I'm excited. I'm going to take some notes. This is the problem. He turns around and goes, hey, you two, go and drive that demon out of that woman. I was like, I was like, say what? <laughs> you know, my flesh, was, I was scared. I'm like, going, and I'm thinking, you don't want to do that. Because you just preach that Jesus will set them free and drive out demons and heal the sick. And I'm 0 and 1. Like, I'm losing to the devil when it comes to this stuff. I've got no experience. And if you send me down there to do that and I fail, you might as well pack up and go home. So I had a decision to make. I could have just said no. But to be honest with you, the Lord knew that if he put me in that situation out of, you know, I'm an evangelist, future evangelist, man of God, I couldn't say no. So he put me in a position where I had to go. So I walked down, and I'm telling you, I wasn't going out. I was just kind of walking slow, going down, praying, praying emergency tongues. <laughs> oh, buddy, I tell you what, I was, I was if, if there's a type of emergency, I was praying it. We, you know, oh. I'm sweating, and all I can think about is the demonic guy that I had met who left the same as when he came. Right? So I'm walking, the Red Sea's parting. Hey, there's, hey. We're not talking about 50 people. We got 12,000 people, and all of a sudden, we're going to try to show what actually happened. So we, wa- we walk up, everything spreads out, and she turns and looks at us, and in perfect English says, don't even think about touching me. Demon speaks to her. I was already scared enough. <laughs> I got, like, hair on the back of my neck standing up. The hair on my hands are standing up, I'm, you know. Right? And it just feels demonic, right? Uh, 
And, and it was only the Holy Spirit. But when she said that, we reached out and touched her. Because I never would have. I would have thought maybe it would have jumped on me. You know, I had no experience, you know. And all the moves and everything. But we touched her. As soon as we touched her, it was like she got shot with a shotgun. And I'm going, woo. <laughs> I didn't feel anything, right? So she gets up. I figured I'll try it again. And I touch her again, and bam, she goes down again. Right? About three or four to fourth time, looked like she was dead. I didn't know if she was dead, if she was sleeping. She was out. I'm like, well, I don't know if this is good or not. And everybody's standing around. Like, it's not, it's messy. Evangelism's messy, right? So the woman comes up, or interpreter woman, and, and talks to them, because in India, the woman, you have to touch the women, the men can't touch the woman unless they're family, and you know, there's some calls. So the woman comes over, starts talking to her, they all start getting all excited, okay? So come to find out, she comes up and gives her testimony, and she says that her father was the highest um, occultic priest in the area, and when she was a baby, he dedicated her to those spirits, and she had been tormented for years, but when we touched her, and ended up being totally set free from the demonic and got saved. Okay? But listen, it had absolutely nothing to do with my faith. I had to step by faith as little as it was. And when you use the faith that you have, it allows the Lord to combine it with his faith. That's where you work one in one with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit. That's where the miraculous happens. You'll never have enough faith on your own to perform one miracle. But if you can mix it with the faith, with God's faith, right? They call it in the Bible, the God kind of faith. He's given us each some faith. We're to work it and develop it. And what happens is the more you do it, the greater the faith rises, right? Before the first crusade I ever did, I'm praying that one person would get healed and one person would get saved. Now when I go, I'm, I'm going, Lord, what miracles are we going to see this week? Because they're going to, we know they're going to happen because it's word, right? We know that that's his word, that signs and wonders are going to follow the preaching of the gospel. Amen. So I tell you this, the Lord wants to get, the enemy wants to keep you from stepping out and the Lord's going to create situations for you to step out so that he can use you because once you get used once, you are ruined forever right? Because you realize in that moment that it had nothing to do with you. It had nothing to do with me. I had no faith. If it depended on my faith, I'd be on an airplane closing down the crusade, getting out of Dodge, right? But I had to say yes. Now, he kind of twisted my arm and didn't give me a real choice, but that's all he's saying because we need to what? We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? And bringing every thought into subjection to what the Word of God says, right? So what the enemy wants to do, because the only thing the enemy has access to is your mind. He's just trying to get you to agree with his lies. That's what gives him power. That's all he has. That's why he says, you know, bring every thought into subjection. Not every thought you have is yours. Not every thought you have is yours. The enemy's trying to get you to believe that it's your fault so that you'll think you're not worthy and God can't use you, which will keep you from actually fulfilling your purpose and destiny. Because we should only think the thoughts that God has about us. What if we only thought about us the way God thinks about us? Well, how do we know what God thinks about us? That's why you need to know the word. You can have all the power and the anointing in the world, but the truth of the matter is if you don't know the word, it ends up doing more harm than good. There's a deep ditch on either side. It's the spirit and the word. You can't have one without the other. You know, if you have only the word, you're going to have a dead church. Right? If you have only spirit, well, you're going to be a bunch of weirdos is what ends up happening. Walking in heresy, you know. And we've seen it. There's excess on both sides, you know. But this is why you need to be grounded in the word. Amen? God is good. He is so good. So he's always going to set you up for your next level. Always, right? So he has me fail with the one demon to get to the next demon to the first time in Nigeria. That's all I did for two hours a night. Person after person after person. But if I didn't have the confidence from him doing it the first time, 
I would have packed up my bags and went home that time, right? So I'm preaching in Nigeria. We're in tent, and we're in the middle of nowhere. We're in the jungle. I have no idea where I am. If they buried me, they still, I still would not be found. First time out there preaching, and I remember they carried in a woman who she was paralyzed. Her legs didn't work, so they laid her across the front, and it was probably where uh, Pastor Holmes is, about that far away from me. Laid her down across the front, and you know, we probably had about, you know, maybe 80 to 100 people there, and I'm preaching away, I'm preaching away, and all of a sudden, something picked her up and threw her at my feet. Right? That'll make you get your attention. Right? Now, I've seen enough of it now that I was, and she started slithering. And so, you know, you kind of figured out what it is, right? So I just point at her and I just say, I command you to loose her and I command you to go right now in the name of Jesus. And I did it two or three times and then all of a sudden it looked like she fell asleep. I didn't know. I'm like, is the demon trying to sleep so it doesn't have to leave? Is that, you know, I, like, I didn't feel any anointing. This is a thing. But again, it's the same thing as salvation. It's by faith, right? The word says that to cast them out, you do it in the name of Jesus and they have to obey, right? So I do it and do it and I do it until it goes and then you move on, right? So I'm like, start talking again. Uh, I, Start preaching again, and then I get a word of knowledge, okay? Now, everybody know what a word of knowledge is? It's just simply the Lord gives you a download, gives you an idea, gives you a picture, says something. He speaks to everybody different because English is not his first language. He has his spirit. He speaks spiritually. I would love the, thus saith the Lord, this person here. It doesn't work that way. That's why you have to have a relationship. If you want to operate in the gifts of the spirit... You have to know his voice, and the only way you can know his voice is by spending time with him. You can't fast and pray for three days and never spend any time with him for two months before that and expect him to use you in the miraculous. It's like the sons of thunder. They're like, you don't even know what spirit you're of. They get sour because they don't want to hear, and they want to bring fire down and kill everybody because they didn't know his heart yet. They were still learning who he was. It's the same way. Why would God entrust you with all of his power if you're going to hurt his kids? They're his kids. But if you spend time with him, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Because if you spend time with him, you automatically begin to get his heart, think the way he thinks, sees the way he, th- he th- sees, and then he can trust you with his power. That's all. It's not like this super abracadabra... Be- Anybody can do it. It's for anybody, right? Even the Holy Spirit says to whomever wants it. For everyone. There's no only certain pastors or evangelists. You know, sure, they may operate in a certain gifting, a certain way. But the truth of the matter is we all have access to the same Holy Spirit and every gift that's needed at that appointed time. The only difference is most of the times the pastors have practiced it more. Because they've had opportunity. And some pastors don't like teaching it because they're scared. Somebody will do it better than them and they might lose their position. Think about it. When people who operate in the gifts, who hates you the most? The people who don't. Why? Because it exposes them being a fraud. Right? Same thing at work. Who does the person who shows up late every day hate the most? The one that comes on time. Right? Because it exposes her lack. It exposes her. So what happens is when you operate... Listen, not everybody's going to like you. The haters are going to be coming out of the woodwork. Because one of two things happens. When you operate in the gifts, okay? Either it makes people hungry and they're drawn to it and they come closer to God. Or they become jealous and become a hater and try to tear you down. And saying, God doesn't do that anymore, or they got sin in their life, or don't listen to them, right? Because you're exposing everything that they're not. You don't hang out with those ones. That's where Jesus said you do this. Shake that dust. Pay no attention. You know, they ain't going to help you. See you later. I'm not going to waste my time on that when there are souls that are at stake. 
Amen. So I get a word of knowledge and sometimes I get like a little fast, almost like movie clip in my mind. Okay. Um, sometimes I get pictures. Sometimes I'll get pain in my body. And what that does is when I get a certain pain in a certain area of my body, it means that the Lord wants to heal that. And it, and that way it builds the person's faith knowing that, Hey, and again, not all your thoughts are your thoughts, but not all your pain is your pain. Think about times you all of a sudden you get this big spear of depression that hits you. You don't know what's going on. Well, what if you're supposed to be interceding because you're picking up and getting a word of knowledge? And we start thinking, I need to go take a Xanax or something. Not realizing it's totally spiritual and the Lord's wanting to use you to minister to his people. Because think about it, maturity. It's all about maturity. When you're a baby, right, everybody has to feed you. When you become a parent, it's not about you. We've got too many people in the church that are grown-ups that should be serving and helping, and God's trying to use them, and they're still sitting here saying, what can you do for me? What can you do for me? Not realizing if you want something from God, why don't you release what's in your hands? And then he can release what's in his. Because whatever you sow, that's what's going to reap. You need healing? Go pray for some sick people. You want a friend? Go be a friend. You want some money? Sow some money. It's not rocket science, but it'll cost you something. Right? I'm just being real. It's... So anyways. So I get a word of knowledge. And what it was, was it was a video of a movie, that, of a clip I'd seen on YouTube like years ago. So I've recognized that when this random thing pops in, that it's the Lord. Okay? So over practice, made lots of mistakes, missed it. But you know what? The Lord knew I was going to miss it before I missed it. But he knew my motivation was out of love and hunger and to hone the gift that he gave me. Right? So because of that, he's going to protect whoever it is. Right now, if your motivation is, I want to be the big man or woman of God. I want to have this ministry. I want to do that. Listen. He'll put you down. He'll put you down. So I get this clip and in it, I remember seeing there was a, a woman and she was possessed and the guy that was preaching was looking at her and said, the demons um, are telling you not to let you pray for me or they will kill you. Okay? So I've got a decision to make. Okay? What's the interpretation of that? Right? How, what does that mean? How does that apply? Right? To this situation right here. And are these people going to think I'm crazy? And what if I miss it? Then I might as well pack up and go home. It's my first day. Right? Let's just be real. Because, hey, spend all this money coming here. If I say something stupid and miss it, I'm going to look like a donkey and the rest of the week's a waste. Right? So, I, it wouldn't leave. It wouldn't leave. So, I said, hey, listen. I go, there's somebody here. And I tried to say it with the most confidence I could possibly have. <laughs> listen, if you're going to walk in this stuff, the truth of the matter is, welcome to being uncomfortable. Because if you were comfortable, you wouldn't realize that you needed God. The reason why you're uncomfortable is because you're going to do something that's supernatural, which means God is taking his super and adding it to our natural. That's all it is. And, it, and, and the whole currency of heaven is faith. You're going to pull on that by faith, by putting yourself in a position, by being obedient to the Holy Spirit. You don't have to make up stuff. The Holy Spirit will guide you and tell you know when you're supposed to give somebody money. You know when you're supposed to pray for somebody. You know when you're not supposed to do something. The Holy Spirit talks to you, you know, right? So what happens is, so I get ready, I say, there's somebody here who has, the demons are telling them, mind you, the girl's just over here, she's passed out sleeping, right? Um, that, so anyways, nobody stands up. I said, they're, they're, they're going to kill you if you let them pray for me. That's what they're saying. And nobody says anything. And nobody raises their hand. And I'm starting to get worried. And nobody's standing up, and I don't know what to do. And maybe I wasn't called to be an evangelist. Maybe, right? I'm telling not every thought's your thought, but listen, when you step out, that's the prime time because the enemy knows once you understand what power that you have and you start to have experience it, he knows that he's done with you. Because what happens is you get to the place with a demonic, I know and it knows that I know that it has to go. Like there's no debate. It's not, I don't have to scream and yell and jump up and down. When you understand the authority, even Jesus cast it out with a word. It's a spiritual. Just because you scream loud doesn't mean you're more anointed. You know? But you know what? If you're, if you're a loud screamer, scream loud. We were talking before. Be you. 
You're at your most greatest anointing is when you are operating who God created you to be. You want to kill your anointing? Try to imitate somebody else. Just because it works for them doesn't mean it works for you because God created you unique. He created you with special gifts and talents, right? So that you can minister to people. He can use you. You're going to hear differently than them. So I give the word, nothing happens. So I figure, well, I might as well keep preaching. Yeah, I'll do a real short one, clean it up, give a quick invitation to say I did it, and I'm getting out of Dodge. That's, it's embarrassing, you know? You got people that are there that, you know, know and seen stuff, and all of a sudden, it's like you're missing it, right? A little humble pie. Well, I start preaching again. Some woman stands up at the back and comes forward. Sure enough, she needed deliverance, drove the demons out of her, prayed for God. You know, she said like she was all well, and she went back, sat down. So before the crusade that night, I asked some of the pastors, I said, listen, guys, go and get me. There were several creative miracles that had happened during the day. So go find two or three of those and have, make sure they're legit, get them checked out, and have them share it with the people at the crusade. Because what happens is when people share their testimony, right, which is the spirit of prophecy... The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That testimony builds their faith so they can believe for their miracle because if he'll do it for them, he'll do it for me because he's no respecter of persons, right? So they come running back to, the, to where we were staying and they said, listen, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what are you talking about? They said, this is the most amazing miracle. I'm like, what? They said, remember that woman this morning that got picked up and she got thrown at your feet and, you, you know, you did whatever you did and, you know, got rid of the demon and, and, and stuff? And I said, yeah. She remember the woman that you called out and, you know, she ended up coming up? I said, yeah. She said, well, let me tell you what she told us. The woman who was at the back who the demons were oppressing and said would kill her, she was, when she was 12 years old, she was walking by the witch doctor's tent. And when she was walking by, she then was attacked uh, by spirits, right? And then what she had to do is obey these spirits. She's killed people. She's put curses on people. She's made people fall in love. She's made people get divorced. She's aborted babies because she could see in the spirit, would command and work with the spirits, and the spirits would go out and fulfill it, right? Just like we got angels that protect us, there's demons that are running around the dark side. The difference is our angels are bigger, stronger, better. Plus, we got the blood of Jesus. Right? Because there's a cheap copy to God's original. Always. Always. You know, the only enemy does tries to do is get you scared. Right? So, anyways, so all these years, and then, so she would do this, and every, everything was fine, but then the, the spirit told her that she had to do something to one of her family members. And she said, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, you know? So when that happened, it turned on her. So then she was tormented, hadn't slept in weeks, tormented with sickness. Does he see? The enemy's fine and good as long as you do what he says. But when you make a pact with the enemy, as soon as you tells you to do something and it doesn't work out, he's going to turn on you. You know, kid in love, he just wants to destroy you. It works like the mafia. Hey, I'm going to get you to kill somebody so that I got that over your head so that you could never leave. That's how the enemy works. You know, that's all it is. You know, it's the oldest game in the book. The truth of the matter is, though, that the blood of Jesus purges us all free, cancels every debt, washes us clean, gets us out of any situation. That's the good news of the gospel, right? So the woman shares, the woman shares her testimony. She goes, this is what, she goes, this is what happened. She goes, yeah. Those demons were saying that to me, and I've seen those demons kill people. I've seen those demons give people diseases. I've seen those demons torment people. So I knew that they were real. She said, they said, well, why did you get up then if you knew that they had the power to kill? She said, because when that man pointed at that body and said, I command you to go in the name of Jesus, she said, I saw those spirits leave in absolute total fear when the words came out of his mouth. So this is what I'm saying, though. I felt no anointing. I didn't even know if it was necessarily real, right? Now, I saw what it was. I commanded it. I don't want to say I didn't necessarily think it was real. But what it was was the Lord was showing me again the amount of authority every single one of us has, and we don't realize it. You see, the enemy has to listen to you when you're using the name of Jesus. The enemy, because it's what the word says. It has nothing to do with your holiness, your walk, your this. It's because you're representing him. Your past is gone. Your past is dead. Don't resurrect it. 
Because the Bible says everything's been washed in a sea of forgetfulness, which means that Jesus doesn't even remember the sins that you had committed. That's the good news of the gospel. We don't need to go preach all this other doctrine. You want to eventually, hey, Jesus loves you. He'll wash you free of your sins, guilt, and shame. He can heal your diseases, set you free, and he's got a plan for your life. And when you die, you will live in eternity in heaven with him. Not rocket science. But you know what? Because it's truth, it's going to make their baby jump. Because it's truth, it's going to make their baby jump. That's why some people keep coming around you and keep coming around you. Just like I said, because when they're in your presence, they're in the presence of the kingdom, which is the spirit of Jesus himself. So to them, they realize that they are in the presence of Jesus, where they have full peace, full shalom, which is peace means nothing missing, nothing broken. Amen?